All right. So I am sharing a screen uh, so that we can learn about another architect. So the architect we're going to talk about and actually build one of his projects um, is Bernard Schumi. Bernard Schumi is a world renowned architect, um, a little older, born in 1950 or 49. He was born in Switzerland and then went to school in Zurich. And the project that we're going to be focusing on is called Parc de la Valette. It's in the northeast part of Paris. So he's working on a, a major competition that he won project um, one country over. So many people that we study in class not only practice, but because a lot of their work is theoretical, um, a lot of uh, academic institutions want these people to come and teach for them. Uh, so he is someone else that has taught at Columbia, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Uh, we looked at Amali Andros earlier this week, um, who was the Dean there. So there's a lot of these names and kind of overlap um, uh, people that uh, you know want to draw these great architects into their schools. Um, some other great work that he's done, he did a, an Acropolis Museum in Greece, um, a science museum in China. He's got work in New York. He also taught at the AA in London, at Princeton, Cooper Union. What a great life, right? So I want to talk a little bit about Parc de la Valette, but I want you to understand where it is and the size and scale. So let's go to Google Earth together, and you are going to search for Parc with a C, de la Villette. All right, and if you have found the location, I want you to kind of zoom out. You can see how it's kind of northeast end of Paris. I don't think you can see the Eiffel Tower from there. All right, so in the early 80s, Bernard Schumi decided to bid on a competition. I think uh, more than 100 entrants. Again, you'll hear or notice that a lot of these famous architects like to compete for competitions because typically in competitions, the client doesn't quite know exactly what they want. So they receive all these entries and then pick from the best. So uh, the idea in Paris um, was that this area of Paris used to be a slaughterhouse. Um, and it was 125 acres large and Paris thought, okay, why don't we reinvent this area, uh, create a competition and ask these architects for ideas on how to insert more, um, cultural types of work, right? So they wanted to draw people, um, to the theater. They wanted a location for a, a train station stop. They wanted an outdoor cafe. Okay. So all of these architects put in their bids and, um, as I zoom out, you can maybe then appreciate that the 125 acres includes north of the canal around that large building. And then just south, there's a lot of uh, green space and it's kind of bound by um, some buildings around that green space. That is the entire 125 acres. So many architects proposed, all right, you want a cultural convention type center. Um, Many proposed one building, okay? But Bernard Schumi said, nope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present 26 little follies, all right? So these uh, kind of points or nodes of madness. Um, so we'll take a look at his winning proposal. So Bernard Schumi thought, well, how can I uh, get someone to uh, explore the park and experience different areas, uh, yet all of those areas feel somewhat connected and uh, a part of a whole. So he overlaid this grid system, uh, kind of odd numbering. You see the lettering at the top, and then it cut off the numbers going vertically. But these buildings have different names. There's 26 of them. So some of them are like L9 or P4, and all the little follies represent um, another task, right? So we'll look at cafes and theaters and um, train station stops. You know, we have this bold red building to kind of uh, draw us to each site. Uh, is it in homage to the, uh, you know, previous use of the site as the slaughterhouse? I don't know. Maybe we're going to explore what red meant to Bernard Schumi in a little bit. But um, so the project that we're going to be working on together is that 
each of you are going to select a small folly or uh, a folly. And uh, then we're going to create the mold and use a 3D printer to print the little follies so that you um, learn how to use a 3D printer and also understand how to uh, create something in Revit that can be printed. And we're learning about the follies. So each folly is a um, is based on its own organizing system. So it's a 36 by 36 by 36 open structural cube. Um, so all of our projects will build that part together. And then depending on which select, which one you select, um, you will add on the theater component or the ramp component. So we'll do parts together and parts away or alone. So the picture on the left um, is a nice visual of a competition board that really speaks to um, the many different follies and how they are organized and arranged on the site giving them some prominence. And then the picture we see in the lower right-hand corner lets us evaluate some of the ordering systems of these cubes and follies. Um, we see a deconstructed uh, skeleton of this steel grid system, uh, the cube with the red, uh, kind of red cube coming out of the gray one. And then some of the parts and components uh, that are moving off from there. A couple other images and ideas for how you can create order in non orderly uh, spaces or boundaries. And some more of the follies. Okay. So we're going to spend some time here in class selecting follies. In the past, we've gone to the library. This travel flance. France Online um, gives you an idea of what some of them look like and their names. Again, all of their names correspond to that grid system. And the idea is that between the last class and your class, we all choose different ones so that in the end we have 21 printed follies. Today, I'm going to set up with you the overall structure of the follies. So, all of the follies are based on this 36 inch, or sorry, 36 foot cube. So, we're going to create some grid lines. We're going to draw some concrete columns. We have not drawn beams yet, so we're going to do that today. Uh, and then, once we establish this common core 36 foot cube, each of you are going to add or subtract. Uh, depending on what the architect chose to do with your particular folly uh, for your building. So the first thing we're going to do is think about the plan. And if it's 36 feet wide and we have this consistent grid column system, let's use some grid lines to establish some constraints on the ground plane. So to find grid, I'm just going to say GR for grid. And I'm going to touch in the middle of my screen, drag it up. And then I have four column lines. So I'm going to add a few more um, GR for grid. And I'm not worried about the spacing and dimension yet. All right, so that's grid lines north to south, but I also need some grid lines east to west. I'm still in the command. I'm going to touch left part of my screen, drag right. And there begins five. I'm going to add four more. Isn't everybody else? get into Google Earth, and we'll search Park de la Valette. So we're going to build, I know it's a little blurry, but we're going to build columns. Columns are in the vertical direction. Beams, those are in the horizontal direction. And we're going to create that cube together. So let's go back to Revit and make sure that we have this 36-foot um, X and Y dimension 
accurately dimension and plan. So I'm going to hit DI to dimension. And I'm just going to choose grid level one and four to start. And gee, mine's twice as big as it needs to be. I'm just going to grab number two. So I've hit escape, escape, touching grid line number two and dragging it left. Touching grid three, dragging it to the left as well. Because when I touch number four, that highlights my dimension. I'm going to touch the dimension line and type in 36 feet. Let's touch the dimension. And then notice what pops up in the ribbon. It says edit witness line. So this means that I could use this one dimension line to add on or divide it into other lines. Why don't we choose, um, I'm gonna hit edit witness line in the ribbon, and then I'm gonna touch grid line two and three, and then click once below that dimension string, not touching any line. Because what I want is that little EQ above the dimension string so that I can click it, thereby making all of my grid lines consistent and equal. We'll make these equal in a little different way. Let's just do a new dimension string. So I'm gonna hit DI, and then I'm going to, in succession, touch one, two, three, and four grid lines and then drag the dimension line up, click into white space, and touch the EQ. So then that should mean, should make one, two, three, and four equal. I want you to do the same thing on your own for the ones in the vertical dimension. So make five, six, seven, and eight all equal. And those also overall five to eight needs to be 36. Okay. Another reason that I like choosing this project is because every floor is consistent. So if I create columns and beams on one level, I can just copy them floor to floor. And some people say, and you're right, you know, why can't I just do one column all the way up and one beam all the way across? And you can if your cube doesn't um, remove any of those parts, right? Like if you were doing this one, part of that project would be removed and then your addition would be the circular walls, right? So I'm going to build them in component parts so that depending on each of your uh, follies, you can eliminate or deconstruct uh, the elements that you need to. So I'm going to place, let me see, 16 columns. I'm looking for a 24 inch by 24 inch column. Eventually, we're gonna 3D print each of your parks, uh, follies, in the 3D printer upstairs. So through this project, you're gonna learn how to 3D print. And sometimes when we print, small models, we need to make elements a little fatter so that they aren't skinny little sticks when we do the model. So uh, these columns that we're designing aren't steel. We're gonna use concrete just so that we can print them. So it's a little different than what you'll see in the drawings um, in the book. But, all right, so let's go to um, the architecture ribbon, architecture tab. And I believe it's in column architecture. I'm looking for a 24 inch rectilinear column, 24 by 24. Okay, we see it? Good. All right, so let's click 24 by 24. And here you need to be pretty careful. So at every intersection of your grid lines, you need to make sure that you are centering the column 
on that intersection. So you can maybe do a whole row and you can place them all individually. I like to place four, grab them all, CO, and copy. But you can do as you wish. Building and plan, but we haven't looked at it in elevation at all. Why don't you go into 3D to the little hot button, the house at the top. Let's click that and you can start to see, huh? an axon of our model. All right, my levels, level one and level two, haven't been set up yet. And I like doing that in a flat front view or an elevation. So I'm gonna click and go to the south elevation. And we're gonna need four levels here as well. I can just touch it and copy it. So let, why don't we do that? All right, I'm going to touch level two, the line of level two, BO to copy, touch the line, drag up, and then I'm still in the command, so I'll drag up a second time and click again and then hit escape, escape for level four. Good. I don't like my grid bubbles intersecting with my levels, so. To pull those up, I'm going to touch the line of grid line four and touch the little bubble that comes up between the symbol four and the line. Hold my left mouse click and drag up. I only see level one, level two in sight, and I don't see three and four, but I want to. So let's go to the view tab in the ribbon. And then plan views is right below that. Click the drop down arrow and touch floor plan. I'm going to select both three and four by holding shift. And then I will say, okay. And I see in my project browser now, I have a level four. Let's go to level two. And tell me if you don't see a little ghost of the columns. Does everyone see the columns at level two? Great. The only thing is I can't click on them, right? Because it's just showing me what's on the ground floor below. Okay. And we need to sign in because I need a beam that doesn't exist in my library. So let's take a minute and sign in to Autodesk. So we're going to insert something from the cloud. So I'm going to go to the insert tab in the ribbon. And then load Autodesk family, search for concrete beam. And I see one that says concrete rectangular. I'll hold my cursor there for a minute and touch load. Does anybody need another minute? Let's go back to a new tab in the ribbon. So beams are considered structural. So I'm going to go to the structure tab and the first icon after modify is beam. So let's click on the beam. And I want my columns, columns and beams to all be the same size. So we need to change, um, let's change the 12 by 24. So let's click 12 by 24. And then right below the properties bar where we selected the beam, there's that edit type, click edit type. To be a good colleague, I'm gonna duplicate this so that I can give it a new name. So edit type and duplicate. Let's call this 24 inch by 24 inch. You can hit okay. Then we look under dimensions. You will learn in structures class 
what a B dimension is and an H dimension is. Um, they dimension all sorts of flanges on steel beams and they have odd numerical uh, associations. So B and H relates to height and width. Let's make both of those two feet. And then we will hit OK. So just watch what happens. I'm going to draw the beam from the center line to the center line, right? And this is fine. It's going to go into my column there. Okay. And that's, that's okay. If you hate that, you can grab the edge of the column, right? So you, if you don't want them to crash, you can grab the edge of the column to the edge of the column, right? And then it looks something like this. So I'm going to give you time. I want you to draw beams between every one of these columns. Do a wall tile with a 3D view like I did. So I did WT and that lets me click on the elements and then go to the other drawing and copy. Does that make sense to everyone? Because we can't grab them in the plan, if you have the 3D view up, you can click things there and go back to the other view to copy or rotate or manipulate. Let's go to the 3D view now. I'm going to just TW for now just to show you. I am going to select only my columns and beams. And if I accidentally grab grid lines, I can unselect those using, I'm just unselecting those holding down shift. And I'm gonna use um, control C. I'll give you a minute to select everything. Remember that we also use the filter one time. You could grab everything and then filter out what you don't want. I just wanna um, copy these on level two and level three, because then I have my um, top level. Whoops, we never shoot. Whoops, we never fixed our levels to 36 foot. So, whoops, we're gonna go back a little bit. Okay, um, escape, escape. Go to our south elevation. I need this thing to be 36 feet tall, not 30 feet. So let's touch, zoom in to 30 feet and click 30 feet twice and change that to 36. And then you're gonna do the same thing for level two and level three. Sorry, level two is 12, level three is 24. You can change it manually with dimensions, or you can still use that dimension string and hit equal. And hopefully everyone, your columns and beams raised with the level. Reselect all of our columns and beams. To do that fast, I'm just clicking left, dragging right, grabbing it all, and then using shift to deselect. Uh, other thing we can do, right, is to grab the things we don't want, element hide EH, just hide all that stuff so that it's not a pain every time you wanna grab it, right? So I'm doing element hide. I grab something and type EH and it hides. Uh, I'm gonna leave mine all there though, okay? Once we've selected and deselected, I'm also holding control if I want to add anything in my selection. Um, let's hit control C. Then I'm going to go back to level two. And because it's copied on my clipboard, all right, I'm going to go to the Modify tab in the ribbon. 
look for the drop down under paste. And I want it to paste aligned to selected levels. So find aligned to selected levels. And let's think about this. I don't, I don't want four levels of this. I just want three. So I only need to add it to level two and level three. And so the top will then be at the roof. Hit OK. And I'll do that again for those of us uh, still getting there. All right, but when you look back in your 3D, it should look something like this then. So in the 3D view, I want you to choose a beam. So if we select a beam and look at the top of the properties bar, you'll see that there is a start level and an end level. So what it's saying, similar to what we did with the sloping concrete floor, is that if you want an angled beam, you tell it that it has a five foot start level. So let's type in five feet in that row and then hit apply. Control Z just to make it go back to normal. Let's go to level one together. Together, we're gonna draw a curving wall I'm going to show you a curtain wall, which is what this aluminum and glass system is here. A curving stair, a curving ramp, and a central stair that has an opening in the floor. So some of those things you might be able to use in your work. Um, some of you will just end up deleting them if they don't apply to your park. Okay, I'm in level one. I want to just do a curved wall. So I'm going to type in WA, and I'm going to click points on grid line 1 and 8. I'm going to use the command below the line tool in the middle of my ribbon, which says I can click on three points to do an arch. I'm going to click that arch line, then the intersection of 1 and 8. 1 and 6, and then I'm going to pull that out. For me, I have a 12 foot radius. And you can just click when you have half a circle. Hey, okay, I'll just show you quickly. You know, what does that look like in 3D? All right, good. I have a curved wall. Go back to level 1. Click on your wall and let's see what if I have curtain wall in my wall types. I believe they're all the way at the bottom. I want storefront, not curtain wall. So change that wall to be storefront just by click, clicking the button storefront. All right. When I start to draw curves, stairs, or ramps, I like to work with something in my plan. So if I don't have a wall drawn, if I just at least have like detail lines with an arc, I'll just do this as an example. You don't need to, you know, just something that defines where my ramp is. I always find it easier to work with some sort of line work in my plan. The other option, which you can do on your own, is just to pull in the plans that you took images of from the book. Uh, and I can show you how to insert images here in a bit too. All right, so using this arc, I'm gonna draw a stair that aligns with that edge. So let's go to the architecture tab. Click on the stair button in the ribbon. And we'll see that we have a couple different circular stair options. Let's try center end spiral first. It's the circular stair in the middle. And I'm going to click that. I just want this stair to go from level one to level two, which if I look at my properties bar, it's already set up that way. And I like this stair because 
I can choose the center point first. So I'm going to click on grid line one and seven, and then pull the stair out. And you can pull it out. Mine goes to about 10 feet uh, radial dimension to align with that outside wall. Does that work for everyone else? Good. Once I click the page, notice the stair's not done. Start to drag your mouse down the page. Draw up or down, it's gonna flip your stair. But just make sure as you draw every tread that you go all the way so that there are zero remaining. I don't want like two steps away from level two, right? So once you have zero remaining, you can click again and then hit the check mark. So let's see, 3D, good. I can see my stair through my curtain wall and it does go to the right level height. It just looks like, oh, I probably need another floor landing or something to go out there later. We're gonna draw another stair, but this time let's draw it on level two. Nope, sorry. Let's go from level one to level three. So let's go back to level one plan. I'm gonna to go to the architecture tab, click on the stair again, because some of our follies have really tight circular tower stairs. I'm gonna select the other option, the full step spiral. That one's just to the right of the automatic selection. The second circle button. And I'm gonna make this one go from level one to level three. So I need to change that in the properties bar. So I'm gonna look at top level and I'm gonna click on the line that says level two to change that to level three. I want the stair in the quadrant of one, two, five, and six grid bubbles. I'm gonna to touch in the center of the square and pull my cursor out so that it says about two foot six, or I have at least some room in the square portion between the edge of the stair and the column lines. I'm gonna click again. It builds my stair for me. And then hit the check mark. You can just exit out of any errors. And let's look at what that looks like in 3D. Okay, good. Tight spiral stair. Let's do a floor on level two. So I'm back in the architecture tab. And find the floor button. And we're gonna do the drop downs architectural and you should get this generic 12 inch floor so in order to create a floor we just need to create a solid perimeter much like we did the sidewalk um we don't have walls yet so the pick wall tool that's the automatic button isn't really going to work you can use the one to the left of it which is pick a line and that will grab the outer side, I'm just going to pick one beam on each side and then pick my curtain wall. I'm going to do that and just trim those lines together. I think there's only one little area lower left where I need to kind of do another tiny little wall there. But why don't you draw the perimeter of your floor and trim all the edges on your own? And then we will. I'll do the check mark together. Okay. So I drew it fast, but you can draw yours any way you like. Just making sure that all of your edges connect. I'm going to hit the check mark, double click your floor to get back into it. And I'm just clicking on an edge. Revit's kind of funny. We always have to click an edge. Double click. In order to Cut holes out of my floor. 
I'm just going to draw another shape on it. And it's going to assume it's a boundary edge. So let's look up in our modify edit boundary tools and pick the circle. In the upper right. And I'm just going to draw a circle starting at the center point of that interior stair. So I'm going to select that. And then drag it out. Till it hits the outside and so I've just created holes in my floor. Like, you don't have to do this, right? But as long as those don't overlap an edge, all of those are going to represent a hole. I'm going to hit my check mark. And then we'll look at what this looks like in 3D. Do you have a hole for your stair? Let's do ramps and railing. So go back to level one. And I want you. Um, just going to delete some of my dimensions to make this cleaner. Um, I want you to draw detail line DL. An arc. That goes between 6 and 7. And then goes above 5 just want you to draw a detail line arc. And we're going to use that as a guide to build our ramp. Okay, let's go to, I think it's architecture tab. And we see ramp. When I click on the ramp, um, we're gonna change the code of our ramp in order to make this one. Um, we can let, let it be from level one to level two. But let's do edit type button. And I'm going to change two things in my dimensions. The maximum incline length, I'm going to change to 100 feet instead of 30. We're going to change 12% to 6%. Or actually, sorry, I'm going the reverse. That's fine. 18 would be higher. All right, so that's six and I hit OK. And then I want you to locate, we're doing an arcing ramp. So let's click the arc in the drawing tools. And you're going to select a center point. So that's probably a section of four and six. Click once. And you're going to pull that ramp out as close as you can to match your detail line. Mine's a little off. Click again, and then I'm just going to drag my cursor along that arc. All the way to the end. Click a final time and hit the check mark. I'm going to look at what this looks like in 3D. Hey, it, mine uh, drew back it, the, it backward. To change that, I just select the ramp and touch the arrow key at the bottom. And now I've got a nice ramp. Let's go to level two, architecture tab. Railing is near the center. I'm gonna click on the top button. And let's just draw one, just one line. I'm going to draw mine column to column. It's about, it's 10 feet. And then I'm going to hit the check mark. It draws the double line railing. Let's look at that in 3D. Okay. If you want to change the style of your stair railings, just like we do the wall, you can touch the railing and you know, make different shapes and sizes. We have never imported anything into Revit, but it is very simple. Um, you go into a floor plan view, you grab the image from your desktop, drag it in and let go. So that's it. I like to have, just like we did in SketchUp, 
the reference image the same size as my drawing. So um, I can help you scale this uh, once you put your drawings in so that you have that 36 foot cube uh, column line to column line. So in PowerPoint, you now have a PDF of the lecture that I have previously given, giving you an understanding and an overview of the points and nodes the day that we selected a folly for ourselves. I know all of you have organized your grids. That's in plan, the 36 by 36, and then your elevation, 36 foot height. I am going to review the camera view again. That was a question that came up the last time we all met. I can find a camera view. This is a perspective view that I'm looking for as a part of your final sheet presentation. You can find that under the view tab, 3D view, go down to camera, or you can create a keyboard shortcut command, camera. I have made mine C-A-M. Okay. So I'm going to type C-A-M. Brings my camera up. I'm going to click on the area as if I am standing in plan looking at the folly. And then I'm going to drag my mouse, in this case in the upper right, right, whatever view I want to take the picture. Click again and then you see a three-dimensional perspective view. Where is this in my project browser? I'm going to go to the left bottom screen. Again, we can collapse and uncollapse all of our different views. But what I see in this 3D view is that it's now created a new view that I can drag on a future title block sheet. Let's say that I want to give my folly a color. I'm going to go down to the bottom panel where we see graphic display options. You can look at what happens when you go to shaded or consistent colors. All of our follies are red. Can't wait to find out why red is not a color. But I want to paint it red. So I'm going to use keyboard shortcut command PT for paint. And if that's not set up, let's go to our keyboard shortcuts. And mine is already set up. What happens when I set PT is that I have a menu that comes up to the side. I want to search for something in there that is already red. Let's see what this carpet looks like. I'm going to select that cover on a face of my folly and click the mouse so that it paints my entire folly red. You do not have to do that. I was just hadn't shared that feature with most of you. Let's click done and I'm going to undo and leave my gray for now. So you all received this update. Okay, let's focus on number two. So what I need to do, I need to place floor plans, elevations, two camera views on a title block. Do we remember how to incorporate a sheet into our set? We're already in the right tab in view. I'm going to look at my project browser on the left and see that I don't have any sheets here. So I need to upload one so that I can create a PDF to turn in. In the View tab, let's click on Sheet. And I don't have a 22 by 34, so let's load one. When I hit Load, I'm going to scroll down to Title Blocks and look for the D, which is a 22 by 34. If some of you do not have this feature, 
you can upload a 24 by 36. I'm going to open, hit OK, and what happens is that under Sheets, I now have a menu that can be uncollapsed. I am going to name this project by zooming into the title block. I am the owner. That is my name. The project name is the number of your folly. So long as I have your name and your folly number, not the number 1 through 26, but where it's located on our plan, that is all I need for you to fill out in the title block. Okay, so I need four elevations and at least three floor plans. It depends on, on your folly. Three or four floor plans. Let's look at mine. So I'm double clicking in the project browser on level one. It looks like I have a level one, two, three, and four is similar to a roof plan, which doesn't show any folly. If you cannot find or you want to underlay to see the level below in your project, we can take a look at how Revit is able to show you these things. Let's go back to our project properties browser. And I want you to scroll down until you see underlay. What this do does is it's going to provide um, just a mask or a, a half-toned plan of what is below the plan you are on. So in this case, my underlay is scheduled as none. I'm going to right click on the bar. I want to see what's at level three below me and I'm going to hit apply and now I see a ghosted version of that plan. Another way of trying to figure out if you cannot find something in your view in level four is if we scroll up in the project browser, sorry, down, it's under extents. We're going to look at the view range and edit. And we're going to take a look at where our plan is being cut. So in my case, I don't see any of the columns at, at the roof or where level four should see. That is because I'm at level four. My cut plane is at four feet above. That means it's above the cube. And if I want to see what's below that cut line, I'm going to have to tell that to cut my plan a little lower. I'm going to change my associated cut plane to zero and my depth level to unlimited and hit OK. And now I'm able to see what should be shown on level four. Let's take a look at this in 3D. So in my level four plan, I am now able to see the columns and beams, columns and beams of the level below. To go back to my sheet, I'm going to click to the project browser, right, toggling between properties and project browser, uncollapse sheets, and double click my A101. I don't have anything on this sheet yet, so I'm going to uncollapse my floor plans, my elevations. I'm going to click once on level one, click and drag. And I am going to place all of the plans on my sheet before I start adjusting their scales. Notice how Revit aligns these automatically. I'm going to go to elevations. I'm 
can drag all of these by just clicking and holding my cursor and dragging that to my sheet. All plans, all elevations, two camera views. So I only created one camera view, which means I need to create another. Maybe I will create another here together. I can double click in a view. What that does is makes the view I'm in slightly darker and grays out everything else I'm in. So if you're trying to do something in your sheet, notice whether or not you're actually in a view. To get out of that view, just double click out into the white space. Double click in a view. I'm going to type in CAM for my camera. I want to take a look at what this wall structure is here. And I'm going to use my crop region to adjust the camera view. Let's look at crop region. So this box represents crop region. When I touch it, there are points that I can grab to eclipse that window. In my properties browser, if I go up to extents, I can check that on and off or keyboard shortcut command KS. I can type in crop region and assign CR so that I can, when typing CR, turn that box on and off. I'm just typing CR. Okay. I'm going to close out of view two. Double click back onto my title block sheet. Go back to my project browser and grab view two that I've just created. Let's say, say I have an odd angled wall. Some of you have walls that are circular. Here's what I recommend for working on those. Let's go back to a floor level one. I can click in my project browser back to level one or click through the viewport in my title block. If at any time you have too many windows open at the same time, remember that you can collapse or close the inactive ones by hitting in the upper browser line, the upper, sorry, excuse me, upper tabs, the button with the X in it. Okay, now these things are, the uh, scales of the drawings are way too large, so I need to change the scale, and I might consider removing my grid lines and elevation marks, because once the scale is small, it's going to clutter up the true element, the drawing, and the building that you've created. Right now, my building has a scale of 1 8. I'm going to double click into that view, and I'm going to change these to 1 16. When I change 1 to a 1 16, my title block line, or my um, viewport name, is now too long. Remember that these are a little difficult to move if you forget. So I double clicked into the sheet space. If I want to move the title, I just grab it. I don't touch the viewport at all. If I want the snap on the end to make it smaller, I touch the viewport once. It gives me the snap and I pull this together. If I want to move both the drawing and the description line, I grab the viewport. So let's change all of these to a 16th. I'm double clicking in them, looking at the lower left hand corner, finding 1 16th. And adjusting the viewport lines. And I'm seeing how these fit on my sheet. Looks like I still need a little bit of space, right? In each one, why don't I go ahead and remove the grid lines and the elevation marks? I'm going to right click on a grid line, override graphics and view by category. That means if anything's a grid line, it will hide. Hide in view, excuse me, category. Same thing with the elevation marks. Right click on the elevation mark, hide in view, category. Now I have 
smaller building, footprints, and I believe they can all fit. I can hide two categories at once by clicking them. And I'm going to align my buildings so that they are all parallel to one another. See this dashed line? I would like them all to be aligned. grab many at once and bring them up and I'm going to do the same thing for the rest. Well, everything fits nicely on my page except that one of my 3D views could be a little larger or smaller. After I've arranged it close on the page I'm going to double click into the view. If I touch the crop region you'll see that in your ribbon above there's a size crop that highlights. I can change the scale by changing the dimension of the width and height, but first I want to change scale so that everything is proportionate when it scales. And let's say I want this to just be slightly larger. Let's try nine inches. Five. I'd like it a little larger still. Scale. Let's put 12 apply. Then I can rearrange it on the page so that the title block view, viewport view is not overlapping. If I want the crop region to be off, I'm just going to select CR in my view. Part of the assignment is printing, or rather saving, this to a PDF. All of you are going to have different PDF versions or ways of creating PDFs on your machine. So I'm going to show you how it works on mine and you might need to look at yours in depth or I'll be available to answer your questions. But I'm going to go up to File, Print, even though I'm saving, right? Or I could do Control-P. And in the name of the printer, I am going to look for a PDF. Choose yours, and then let's make sure this sheet is printing the right size. Let's go into Properties, and that shows me that I have a landscape, that is right. And then let's look at Setup. So that's in the bottom, bottom lower right hand corner. Because I chose the 22 by 34, I'm going to look for that size in this drop down menu. If you chose a different size, make sure you select the correct one. I don't want it to fit it to the page because I don't want Revit to scale it for me. I want it to be at 100% zoom. So I click that, hit OK, and let's preview. Looks good. I'm going to hit print. That really means save. I'm going to hit OK. And this is the file that I will turn in via email. And then your PDF should come up. I want something else in this PDF. I'd like you to open up Site, where you'll see that I have created a sidewalk and a grid pattern based on our folly numbers. And let's look at this in 3D. If we want to look at 3D, you can always go to the View tab in the ribbon, 3D View, clicking that, or the House in the top ribbon panel. If we want to zoom and hold some element of our park plan in the center, I like selecting 
and element before I start using shift and clicking and holding the scroll bar. Right? So I select an element and then I can easily rotate around it. So it looks like I have two follies in here. How did I do that? We're going to learn next how to link our colleagues, peers, projects into our landscape. So let's go back to the site and import through here. So you'll notice I already have two projects, right? I have what looks like R4 and I have a dumb version, someone else is creating a better version in this class of R7. So if you have named your project perfectly, then no one will have an, uh, an issue with where to place it on your map. If you are in 2019, this, you need to create this grid for yourself. How do you do that? What I have hidden in 2020, let's see what I've hidden by revealing the light bulb, is the map from our PowerPoint, right? Showing me the grid. Do we remember how to import images? Let's do that together. I want to insert something. I'm going to use insert to insert Revit and images into my Revit file. When I go to the insert tab, I want to look for inserting an image. So it's near the middle. I'm going to, and because I only have one image in that file, the bullet map, that one shows up. I say open. Okay. And I place. It is very small. So I grab a corner and expand it. I need to rotate this. So I'm going to type in RO for rotate. I'm going to click it once, type in UV degrees. That doesn't work. So you're going to have to align this with an edge that you find in the sidewalk plan. Once you do that, you're going to have to scale and move the plan so that it is arranged properly. I'm hiding the one I've already scaled. And you'll notice that I have pinned it, right? So when you click it, you cannot move it. If you need for some reason to move anything, you can UP or unpin. And then what I simply did was created a grid line over that using detail lines, DL, and overlay that line on the image. Things get a little cluttered with that image, so if I want to hide something, I'm going to type in EH for element hide. Don't forget our other keyboard shortcut commands, wall uh, window tiling, WT, and then if you want to go back to the window you were on as a sole window, TW, the reverse works to go back where you were. How do I import another Revit file now? In that same insert ribbon, I'm looking for something that says link Revit. I'm and that is going to place it probably where I have a previous file. And it looks like yes. Right, so now I have two here. And I can grab the one I just imported. If I'm unable to grab it, sometimes this selected links is off, right? So if that has an X through it, I cannot touch this. Make sure your links are on. Grab L3 and locate L3 in the quadrant of L3. And then save. So I've created 3D views, placed everything related to my folly on a separate sheet. You need to still write why red is not a color. When you write that in your software, that too should be saved. Right, saved, printed, same thing, to PDF, regarding PDF. In, place that in the same file. So now I have a few pages in my PDF, my Word, and then two Revit files. The last thing I need from you so that I can collect all our SDLs and teach you how to 3D print them is creating that STL. So I'm going to go to my folly, go to a 3D view, 
I want this to print at 1 16th scale. So change this to a 1 16th scale. Make sure that's 1 16th. We're going to add-ons in the Revit, Revit ribbon, STL exporter for Revit. You may leave this as is, right? PowerPoint says, just binary. Make sure that's selected and then hit save. You're going to name the file, right? The way others have, have named it. And that is their number and their name. Seven. Just R7 and your name. Seven, so I'm just making mine trial. Back in Revit, let's say you want to review what you've imported linking-wise and what you haven't. Let's go back to the Insert tab. And we are going to manage the links. So this shows you what you have and have not imported. It helps if you're in the right file. So insert, manage links. Okay. I have in the past unloaded or loaded others, but not reloaded as I changed different computers. Yours might also show up as this, right? But what this will tell you is that R7 is loaded, L3 is loaded, and nothing else is. So don't worry about the ones that aren't loaded. Just continue loading the ones that you find in our Revit file. And hit OK. There's one more resource that you might find helpful. It helped me when I was learning Revit too. And it's what ways and reasons that things might be hidden in Revit. So this is a revitforum.org. It's a nice search feed for Autodesk products. And you can scroll through these options if what I mentioned in my video isn't helping you with your specific issue. Or of course, please email me 